You're listening to episode number 231 of the Made for Living Well podcast. And today, we're talking all about brain energy. This is the Made for Living Well podcast, hosted by Alexa Sherm, the place to create a life well lived. Welcome back to this podcast. As always, my name's Alexa, and I'm so glad you're here at the Made for Living Well podcast, which is exactly what I believe, that you were purposed in health for health, and that health is already inside of you. And here at the podcast, I want to teach you how to live that out so you don't have to go another day in your life searching for health, but you can live in health. Now, today on the show, we do have a special guest, and I'm excited to bring this guest on to talk about energy in the body. And not just energy in the body, but we're specifically going to get into brain energy and how to energize your brain so that you can feel energized throughout your entire body. Today's guest is Dr. Doug Pucci. Dr. Pucci has been a board-certified practicing natural healthcare provider for over 20 years. He has multiple degrees and focuses, including that in neurology and also energy movement in the body. In his practice, he provides comprehensive testing for health biomarkers, advanced discovery, and brain-body well-being with personalized nutrition for a diversity of people and symptoms. Dr. Pucci is truly on a mission to help people get to the root cause of their health problems, not just Band-Aid approach the system. So I'm excited to have him on. Like I said, we're going to be diving into mitochondria and energy and specifically how to amplify the energy inside your brain because it is the number one user of energy in your body. Now, if you want to learn more about Dr. Doug Pucci, I would recommend you head on over to his website. Dr. Doug Pucci.com, and that's D R D O U G P U C C I.com. If you can't find it, I'll link it up in the show notes. So make sure you head on over there at the Living Well and check out my eight ways to increase your brain energy inside of your body. And it goes along with today's episode. So today we're going to dive into why it needs to happen, why it's important, and over at The Living Well, I give you some specific pointers and realistic steps to help you take things to the next level. Now, before we get started and into the interview, I also want to remind you there's all kinds of good stuff over at The Living Well, including a free energy quiz. Now, the purpose of this energy quiz is to help you understand, are you functioning with enough energy or Is your body in desperate need of that? And whatever level you fall in, I give all kinds of help to help push you forward into an energized state, what I call thriving. That is truly my mission in life is to help you live with health and thrive inside of it. So head on over to thelivingwell.com, check out that free energy quiz. All the information inside is completely free and it's 100% worth it. And If you have time, leave me a message on what your results showed because I would love to know and help you along in the process. Again, head on over to thelivingwell.com to check that out. And one last announcement before we go. I know that this show is just getting kicked off and The Living Well is just starting. I'm so grateful for you. It really would mean the world to me if you would share the show with your friends and family, whether you take a screenshot and drop it on social media or send a few emails out, having or telling other people to listen to the show is really the lifeblood of how this grows and how other people hear about it. So like I said, it would mean the world to me, especially as we're building up the living well and really making its name stand and a foundational place to understand health, not just to do more things, but to unleash it in your mind, body, and soul. I have a lot of good things left in store this year and a special series happening on the podcast this summer all about sexual health. Yes, we're going there. And I even giggled like a middle schooler, but we are going there and it's going to be so good. So stay tuned for that. But for now, let's get right to the show with Dr. Doug Pucci. Welcome to the show, Dr. Pucci. I am so glad that you are on and you're going to come on and explain a topic that we've been rolling with for a while, and that is energy movement. And we're specifically going to talk about energy in the cells and really getting to these root cause of a lot of the symptoms so many people face. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Alexa. Yeah. So first of all, I just want you to tell us how you got into this field and why you took an integrated approach to medicine. 
Oh, okay, great. Yeah, like how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the short, my wife is always like, make it shorter. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the short of the long answer is I'm actually in practice 30 years. Um, I began as a chiropractor, but what, what it was was in my first 10 years of chiropractic, I was helping people. I was a little frustrated, though, with the fact that I wasn't helping everyone that I thought I should be helping. The short of it was is that I realized that there were so many people that I was seeing that had underlying uh, metabolic problems. They had mm -hmm. hormone imbalances, they had blood sugar issues, they had gut issues and infections and dysbiosis. And unless I was really addressing these underlying factors that was affecting energy on so many different levels, is that, you know, they didn't have the resiliency to even be uh, well served through chiropractic. So I was forced really to go back to school. Um, and I began my journey first in brain, what is called functional neurology. And uh, understanding how much energy the brain uses is that I definitely needed to get reschooled and uh, learn more about functional medicine. And that really pushed me into that. And I began my functional medicine journey probably now, I started about 15 years ago, and I've been kind of all in over the last 12 years, uh, just rooted into functional medicine mm. as my primary uh, practice. That's where I'm at today. And yeah. it keeps evolving, it keeps growing because, you know, in the world of functional medicine, uh, just through research and the science that's going on with genetics and whatnot is it's constantly evolving. Um, and so, you know, things that we knew even five years ago about the immune system related to autoimmunity has been turned a little bit upside down. And there's different approaches and strategies. So you have to be continuously learned and staying up with the research to be able to be able to offer to people the best solutions. Yeah, yeah. And it has changed. Yeah. And you've been through, I mean, you have so many different paths that you've taken, but like yeah, you said, yeah. they all kind of come to this integrative approach. And, you yeah. know, I, I think so much of health has been segmented into systems. And while that can provide benefit in some areas, I still feel like we have to look at the body as a whole unit mm -hmm. and see how we're working together. And I think that's the power of understanding energy movement. What is, what is your take on, you know, getting people to see outside of their systems, to see outside of their symptoms even, to really get into that root cause. Yeah, I mean, that's always like the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the strategy, I guess, right, through all of our education is to help people to kind of see their, their, their symptoms, their signs, the direction of their lives differently. Like I always tell people like, you know, in medicine, uh, and there's a place for medicine, certainly, but, uh, you know, I call it, there's a lot of ologists. Mm -hmm. Right. You have a yeah. gut problem, you see a gastroenterologist. Yeah. You have a heart problem, you see a cardiologist, you know, a lot of problems, a urologist, a lot of ologists. And they have one department and they see one thing. Um, and but really what their goal is through their testing, through their analysis is simply is to rule out pathology, to mm -hmm. rule out a disease process. That's why so often you'll hear, at least I hear from, you know, people is that, you know, they have a litany of symptoms. They're seeing doctors and they doctors can't find anything wrong with them mm -hmm. uh, because they're simply looking for disease. Um, and then they wind up, of course, as you know, they wind up going to the internet and they're Googling all their symptoms, which makes them a nervous wreck. And uh, they're, yeah. they're trying to learn things that way. But really fundamentally is we're understanding is that, you know, all these systems, not that we're learning, but we understand is that, you know, all the various systems, your cardiovascular system, your nervous system, your endocrine system, hormone system, are all connected, they're all interrelated. Um, and as a functional doctor, what we're really looking for is the underlying root cause of their symptomatology and their signs. You know, whether it be depression, whether it be loss of energy, whether it be gastric problems, whatever it is. Um, it's just like a simple example I give to, in my, in my talk to people is, you take blood pressure, for example. Uh, in a medical world, right, you have high blood pressure, you put on blood pressure medication. Does it work? Yes, it works. It will lower your blood pressure. But if you ask your prescribing doctor, you know, when can I give the blood pressure medication? The answer is going to be what? It's going to be never. You're on mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Because what happens if you stop taking your blood pressure medication, what's going to happen? The blood pressure is going to go right back up. Yeah. Because the point is simply, is right, is that the blood pressure medication is not addressing the real cause of why you have high blood pressure. So even though the blood pressure medication is controlling it and you want that, the underlying root mechanisms are still percolating. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not being addressed, eventually your body is going to begin to express dysregulation someplace else. And it can be an entirely different system. You know, say your gastric issues and then you see a gastroenterologist and nobody's making the connection that your gastric problems and your blood pressure problems are maybe rooted in the same fundamental cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where we look at things. Right, right. 
Do you feel like there is uh, generally a similar underlying cause or do you feel like that is very specific to the person? Well, I, that's, I think it's two. I think it's both. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, certainly globally, um, you know, we like, for example, when we work with our patients, we always say to people that we have to macro manage before we micro manage. Mm. Uh, there's no, you know, supplement that you're going to take a combination of supplements you're going to take that's going to, you know, out supplement, you know, poor dietary choices and lifestyle choices. So you have to. So from a global standpoint, everybody can do better with diet. Everybody can do better with right. sleep. Everybody can do better with exercise. I and mean, we all know those kinds of different things. Where things do get individualized, and it is personalized medicine, is where you start getting into that. And maybe you you do some of the, uh, you know, many of one of the maybe many functional uh, lab testings that are there. So when you run a functional test on, let's say, the GI situation, you know, one person may need to take a, her, a, a strategy that's completely different than somebody else. Mm. Uh, same mm-hmm. goes for hormones, same goes for, you know, just about everything. So it's a combination of both. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that really makes sense. Yeah. At the, the external value, the big, the big picture is it's very similar, but when you get personalized, it does change. It's personalized. And even yeah. for myself, even for myself, I mean, there were things that I'd have to, I do today that I didn't do two, three years ago. I got to keep tweaking things all along. I run functional lab tests on myself kind of consistently. And uh, even though I live a pretty healthy lifestyle, there's always things I could tweak and get better at. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm constantly kind of navigating and kind of redirecting the sails of my ship a little bit, right? And trying to head on to a, into a better course of direction. Yeah. 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 That really makes sense. So yeah. we've been talking about energy here on the mm-hmm. podcast for quite some time. And and I just would love to get your take on energy in the body. And specifically when you get into the neurology side, as you mentioned, you worked with energy in the brain. What are some of those fascinating points that you think is really important for the average person to know and pay attention to when it comes to energy movement inside the body? Well, if you're talking, when you say brain, um, I think that's an important thing. I think that's quite overlooked, unfortunately, until it gets into the very late stages of when people have dementia. <laughs> mm. um, but early on is that so many people have signs and symptoms of a fatigued or low energy brain. Like People think of energy as just like, oh, I'm just tired through the day. Uh, I don't have the same energy I had last year. I don't recover from my exercise. And that's all very, very, very true. But they don't think about signs of brain. Um, you know, very clearly it's like if a person is saying, uh, you know, I, uh, my, I read a book and I just can't seem to like get past two pages and I got to put the book down. Mm. Uh, am I losing my concentration? I can't remember what I'm reading. Uh, those are signs of poor, what we call poor energy or poor endurance. Um, that's one of the classic signs that we see when we test people. Um, a simple example, I'm just kind of getting to like, if I test a person neurologically, I might just have them do what was called a pursuit, just following my finger with their eyes back and forth for several, tenfold, 15 times. Mm. And you might see them doing it pretty good for the first three, then all of a sudden it starts to get really sloppy. That's an indication of en- poor energy in the brain. I often ask people, it's like, when you think about energy, um, I give them a choice, like, you know, which organ or which system uh, is the greatest consumer of energy. Is it your heart, the cardiovascular system? Is it the digestive system? Or is it the neurological system? And most people would probably guess it's the heart. But the reality is it's actually your brain. Your brain consumes 20 times more energy than any other organ in the body. It's extremely greedy. And if it's not getting enough energy, it's going to rob energy from other parts of the system. Mm. Um, so every time, lots of times we also we see, kind of see global energy. We're just kind of fatigued them, dragging through the day. Women are trying to get up, get through the day, and it is struggling, tired when they wake up. And uh, no one's really giving consideration to, is it really the brain that's zapping it? And that's kind of what we see. So what are some things that, so you're saying like there's, uh, there's times when the brain unnecessarily takes more energy than it needs, fatiguing other parts of the body, or is it the other parts of the body are fatiguing the energy level so your brain doesn't have as much energy as it needs? Well, it's both, but I'm saying is that the brain is the largest consumer. Mm -hmm. Your brain is your greatest asset. Your brain regulates and runs the whole show, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And uh, we know what it's like when we have brain fog, right? (laughs) And that's a sign of a tired brain. Simply Mm -hmm. put, I have brain fog. It's a tired brain. But because the brain is such a consumer of energy and literally it runs the show, it keeps you alive and ticking. Your heart doesn't pump without your brain's input. Right, is if the brain is not getting sufficient energy, it will pull and rob energy from other systems to keep the brain ticking. Mm-hmm. 
right? Yeah, so it can pr it can pull energy from your gastrointestinal system, and you don't digest food as readily. It can pull energy from your liver's detoxification, and you can't detoxify as readily. Mm -hmm. It's really more of a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is low brain energy, would you say, a root cause of mental illness? Obviously, you talked about dementia. Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a you know good segue. I think it's really mm -hmm. important to kind of go there. It's like you know, mental disease today is, uh, and for good reason, is certainly coming into light. Right? It's mm -hmm. being talked about openly, and it's a really good thing that finally it's coming into light. And it is interesting that we're seeing a shift in a model of approach of mental disease, like depression and bipolar and schizophrenia, but using depression, which affects so many people, young, middle-aged, yeah. old people alike, right? Uh, regardless of race or age or, you know, anything. Um, the model used to be, right, that it was a chemical imbalance. Yeah, yeah. Simply chemical. And then the treatment would be what? A chemical intervention. Give you a chemical drug to kind of fool or manipulate your brain chemistry to give you an effect. That it would have an effect, but it also has a lot of side effects. And oftentimes it doesn't last really long and you're constantly playing the merry-go-round of switching from one medication to another medication. But what's really coming to light today, and thankfully scientists and even psychiatrists are starting to open up to this, is what we call an energy deprivation. Uh, mostly what we call, is an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking at uh, mental disease as an inflammatory response in the brain, meaning the brain is inflamed. And when it's inflamed, it's going to lose energy. So there is a principle or a theory. I wouldn't even call it a theory. It's more of a principle, which is known as the uh, mitochondrial component of depression or the mitochondrial component of mental disease. Um, or even the mitochondrial component to aging, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so if I go on that a little bit, um, you know, if, if your audience, I don't know if they've heard of the mitochondria, um, but inside of every cell of your body, um, is the D is your DNA, your nucleus carries your DNA and your DNA is carrying your genes, which transcribes and says, what protein should they make? Should I be a heart muscle? Should I be a retinal cell of the eye? What should I be? But in order for your DNA to do that, to make a protein, it needs energy. Mm -hmm. So when we think about energy, yeah, people experience it globally, right? Just tie it through the day and so on and so forth, right? Don't have the same stamina. But really, what's it's really happening at a cellular level. The cells of your body uh, don't have sufficient energy. And what's inside of your cells are these organelles, which are called mitochondria. They're often referred to as the battery or the power plant, but it's the energy factory. That is where the cells make energy. Some cells uh, of your body, you know, maybe have like 10, 20, 30 of those mitochondria packed in there. Other organs like your heart, uh, your muscles, and the brain cells called neurons literally have thousands mm -hmm. of mitochondria tightly packed in there because those organs, those cells of those organs are highly demanding of energy production. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when, you know, we just know that unfortunately, as we age, uh, if you get after the age of 20, literally every decade of life, we lose about 10% of our mitochondria. That's just averaging. So these theories of, of depression, these theories of anti-aging is really, it's the loss of mitochondria. So there are some components of losing mitochondria that are because of age, but we now know that we can actually slow down the loss of mitochondria. We can actually drive and create new mitochondria. So then therefore we can actually reverse aging. Um, back to the depression and mental disease things that the scientists are beginning to understand that mental disease is really more of an energy deprivation problem of the brain. Mm -hmm. So just maybe I'm going too far into this, but we know, for example, depression resides in the left frontal area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. So if you kind of tap the left forehead, yeah. that's your frontal cortex. And it's when the neurons called the brain cells called neurons do not have enough energy, they are not firing. So it's called an under or hypo firing of that area. And that is a classic sign of depression. So a lot of the treatments in trying to remedy depression is to how do we improve the firing of those neurons in that part of the brain? And so from my background, because mm -hmm. I have some of my background in functional neurology, if I started to do things to fire the frontal lobes, and that could be through eye movements and uh, finger touching movements and just some sensor inputs to that brain, 
But if I didn't address the why they have low energy, then yeah. the neurological exercises were not helping. In fact, that might even make them worse. And that's the term clinically, it's called exceeding metabolic capacity, meaning you're doing an exercise to improve these neurons, but they did not have enough mitochondria or enough energy resource to handle the exercise. It's like going to a gym. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're tired or your blood sugar is too low and you're trying to exercise, you don't have the energy and you probably feel worse off when you finish your exercise versus if you're fueled properly, then you have a lot more energy to do the exercises. So in order to help people's brains, one, you got to start with addressing all of the issues or the fact is that's zapping their energy on a cellular level. And as you start to improve that, then you can come in and start giving them targeted exercises to start to fire to those regions of the brain to improve how that area functions. And you start to get improvements in their depression mm. or their moods or their bipolar and all those kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Really. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. But yeah. like you said, it's like that twofold approach of, you know, we can't just do one thing without missing that energy component, which is really foundational. And I think, a yeah. yeah. I think a confusing topic is, is that we've quantified energy and input based on almost a calorie focus, um, right. getting us into macronutrients, but there's a lot of other modes of energy inside the body. But can you just talk specifically about that? You know, like where are the mitochondria getting the energy? How's that movement through the body and what other sources of energy are there outside of food? Well, um, outside of food, certainly like, all right, so the mitochondria, like the way I explain it to people in the office and people I work with uh, virtually um, to help them get a grasp at the concept of this, right, is um, your mitochondria obviously are inside of your cells, right? And so you got to be able to get nutrients inside the mitochondria, mm -hmm. Um if I can make this clear for you, right, is your, the cells themselves are, it's like a wall. The, the wall of a cell called the membrane is made up of two layers of fats. So the first thing we know is that when we, when we hear a lot about essential fatty acids, or maybe people are more familiar with like things like what they call omega-3s and omega-6s, um, they're essential, meaning you have to get them from your food source. Your body doesn't make it. But these membranes are made up of these essential fatty acids. And so if we don't have appropriate amounts of these fats, is then you're not feeding the membrane. Right? And we're exposed to a lot of toxins in the world. And so these toxins can begin to create what we know call, the term is called oxidative stress. Literally that membrane, that fatty membrane starts to rust. And then when it rusts, it gets hard and it becomes less permeable. So the nutrients that you're taking in um, cannot get into the cell. They're being blocked mm. because of this hard membrane. And the mitochondria also, you know, as it's manufacturing through a process called the Krebs cycle, is producing energy molecules. And as it makes these molecules, it's creating some waste, um, which are just called reactive species. Um, and your body has to quench those and get them out. But if the membrane is rusted, you, you have a twofold effect where you can't get the nutrients in. So the mitochondria don't have the nutrients. And whatever energy they're producing, they're producing these waste products, which are not being eliminated from the cell. And so those toxins that are remaining inside your cell start to damage the mitochondria and cause that mitochondria to break down, becoming less efficient. The easiest analogy people seem to wrap their heads around is I use a, you know, the analogy of a car. Uh, if you're driving a, a, you know, a, a gasoline-driven car instead of uh, an electric car these days, but you, know, you have a fuel tank and you fill it up with gas. Great, you got a full tank of gas. But there's a fuel line that goes into the engine. That's the first thing. So the gas in the tank has got to get to the engine. It sprays the engine and it combusts. So the first thing is we don't want to have that fuel line blocked. It doesn't make a difference if, if you have a full tank of gas. If the gas is not getting into the engine, the fuel is not being delivered. Right? That's what we hear about when we know like pre-diabetes or insulin resistance. Right? Insulin resistance means that the glucose that you're getting from food is not getting inside your cell. Mm -hmm. And glucose is a, is a fuel for the mitochondria. So that's a fuel delivery problem, right? But once the gas gets into the engine, the engine is combusting and it forms power. So you hit the accelerator, the car goes down the road. But what goes out the tailpipe? It's carbon monoxide, which is the byproduct of burning gas. Mm -hmm. So we're not living on gasoline, right? But we're living on blood sugar, glucose. We're living on fatty acids from fats. We're living on oxygen. These are the basic substances. 
So we have to be able to get oxygen and glucose and fatty acids inside your cells. We also have to get a lot of cofactors that the mitochondria mm -hmm. needs in order to make this whole mechanism work. And those are going to be things like hormones, like your thyroid hormones and magnesium, right? And iron, these are, and B vitamins, these are critical. Also things like coenzyme Q10 and vitamin K. I mean, the list goes on, but these are all cofactors that are working in symphony inside the mitochondria in order to eventually create these energy molecules. So if we're not getting these nutrients inside the cells, then there's no way the mitochondria is going to be able to make energy and then we suffer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about these nutrients, right? Like it's more than like going back to the calories, it's more than just a calorie count. There's nutrients right that are necessary. And so when people are thinking about energy, they're probably thinking, oh, I supply myself plenty of energy, but the quality of what you're supplying is significantly changing how your body's using that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you can get the same amount of calories from a low, from a slice of white bread as you can from an apple, right? But the apple obviously is constituting a lot more nutrition and vitamins and nutrients that in the right matrix and combinations that the body can use inherently for energy in the white bread, same calorie count, this is going to zap you it because the cat, the energy from the white bread is not going to get inside your cell. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the difference. It's like a car. Again, you know, if you, if you had a very expensive sports car, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a sports car, you're probably not going to pull it up to the gas tank and put the cheapest amount of gasoline that you could in there. Right. Right. Because, you know, it knows it needs high octane fuel to get the performance out of it. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Put, unfortunately, as human beings, we put more attention and uh, we spend more money on the cars and taking care of our cars than we do our own yeah. health and well-being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, some statistics coming out, you know, that are stating that uh, the emotional energy toll on the body is significant. And I think that there's a lot of other sources of energy or energy depleters that we come in contact to. What is that emotional role on our mitochondria? The emotional role. Like the, the emotional toll on our energy levels. You, I mean, as you've studied energy in the brain and, you know, kind of these. You yeah. Know. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, you know, that would be like a whole other podcast unto itself. <laughs> I know. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you start getting into the whole world, I mean, I spent a lot of time studying. So I was actually listening to some things this morning, you know, but it's a, a big part of where do we put our energy? Right. And we start mm -hmm. getting into the world of our thoughts. Uh, and we, most of us are just operating on autopilot unless we are purpose, purposely, intentionally not doing that. And that requires exercise. Um, but, you know, I mean, most of us are just going through our day and our brains are on autopilot. Uh, our, you know, it's like um, um, we're not really in control of our day the way that we think we are. Right. We're mm -hmm. really we're really working on a on a uh, 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 on a consistent uh, platform, our way our brain works is through this neuro, neuro, neurological network and it kind of gets hardwired, right? So we continue to kind of create the same behavioral patterns because the brain is familiar with that. But unfortunately, so much of that uh, familial pattern does not support us. Um, let me just segue. I mean, maybe I'm not too, too clear. Yeah, yeah. The way the, the, way the brain works, it, this is, you know, trying to make it simple. There's a term called plasticity. Uh, in the ne neurology world. I don't really care for that word because it kind of conjures up hard, but what they mean by plasticity is actually moldable, right? But the way the brain works is like, um, when, you, when you do something from early on, uh, you want to learn to play an instrument, right? And you practice, or you, you want to play a sport and you, you go and you practice your golf swing, you practice your basketball shot. You know, the reason why you practice something over and over and over again is you develop more brain cells called neurons start to connect. And so you, you develop a larger pool of connection of neurons. Mm. And what that does is it makes your brain more efficient. So if you're studying, let's say, playing the guitar, after a while, is you don't think about where to hold your fingers or how to strum. You can just read the sheet of music and then just play. Like You don't think about getting in a car and where to put the foot and we'll hit the gas. Right? We just get in and we go. Because you do it enough times, your brain neurons connect and it becomes very efficient. And that can serve us in good ways, but it can also serve us in bad ways. Because if we have repeated thoughts, repeated behaviors that are conjuring up negative experiences, again, we develop a, a big pool of neurons. Unfortunately, that makes that experience efficient. 
Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, people can just get up in, in the day and just look in the mirror or just say something to somebody. And right away, their neurological pathway gets turned on to a negative experience. Mm-hmm. And when they're in a negative experience, basically, is they're going to be your, your brain works by going into a stress response, a survival response, because your negative experiences is 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 the fight or flight experience mm-hmm. and so when you're in that fight or flight experience from that pattern of negative thought is you pump out the stress hormone specifically cortisol right and those things are going to start to zap your energy i don't know if i'm making that yep 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 no that's, that's great clear if it's yeah. not clear but um, i can go expand a little bit on that but um yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, if your audience has heard of things like, I mean, maybe they've heard of the fight or flight response. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about this all the time. You know, the world that we live in today, um, the, 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 this is the analogy that I use for people in the office that, like, explain this to me a little bit better. And that's why I say, look, you know, this goes back literally to, to a caveman and a cave woman walking along on a nice sunny day. And they're enjoying their sunshine, they're getting their vitamin D, and they're eating berries and they're fueling their bodies. They're having a lot of laughs, they're enjoying the day, and they're thinking about procreating and having a couple of kids. Isn't this great? Mm -hmm. And then they sit down and they look over their shoulder and there's a saber-toothed tiger drooling. Well, Mm -hmm. they drop the food. Right. They're not thinking about having kids. That's off the table. Now they're shifting into survival mode. They're either going to run from the animal or they're going to try to fight it, but they're in survival mode. Okay. And if the animal goes away, hopefully, then they can think about eating food and having a conversation about having children. Mm -hmm. And that's what's supposed to happen, right? I could take my dogs hiking. um, And I live near kind of a mountainous, you know, river area. And we go out there and, you know, there's always ducks and geese in the river and all that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, you'll see a couple of geese get into a little fluster with each other and the feathers are flying. And it lasts like three, four, five seconds. And then they both turn around, they both kind of continue swimming down like nothing happened. Like they have their little, you know, issue and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. And that's how animals are, right? A deer runs from the coyote and runs fight or flight. And when the threat is gone, they go back to grazing. Yeah. But human beings, we don't do that. We don't do that, human beings, right? We carry stuff with us. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is a fight or flight response. So, you know, as human beings, like my example is like, you know, because we have this frontal lobe of our brains, it's so fascinating. Like it serves us in so many ways because it's the newer, higher brain. It allows us to predict the future, the frontal lobe. What does that mean? You're driving your car down the road and someone kind of cuts off in front of you and, and you hit the brakes. Yeah. Like you can kind of foresee if you don't do something, the ramifications, I might have an accident. That's predicting the future. And your frontal lobe allows you to do that. Right. But this primordial response, this fight or flight response is lower in the in the brainstem. And so when we're in a fight or flight response is the blood is pulled away from the frontal lobes. Right. So we don't activate the frontal lobes. We activate mm-hmm. the primordial response. And that's your fear based center. That's mm-hmm. where anxiety is stemming from. Right. And so we get really conditioned. So again, back to neuroplasticity is the more that's going on and going on and going on is that we, we rewire our brains where that limbic system, that emotional center called the amygdala center, your fear-based center gets really easy to turn on and your higher brain gets harder to turn on. <laughs> mm. Right. And uh, that's what I mean. So yeah. we get really stuck in this fight or flight response in the world today with COVID and everything else yeah. going on. Yeah. Is that we're just it's hard. So everybody that we see is, is that we're neurologically we're stuck in this what we call fight or flight, which is called your sympathetic mm-hmm. nervous system. And we have a real hard time activating our nurturing and growth and healing component, which is called the parasympathetic. Mm. Yeah. Right. And how do those two states influence the, the mitochondria then? How does it what? How do those two different states, you know, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, how would you say they inter- influence our mitochondria or even the, the energy inside of our brain? Yeah, good question. So, yeah, so if we're in a constant state of sympathetics, we are, you're, you're basically the, you're on, the gas pedal's going, mm-hmm. right? It's go, 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 go. You're running away from the threat that requires energy. Um, and you're pumping out stress hormones like cortisol. Um, and that's okay for a really short duration. That's how it's intended to be for a burst and then go back to nurture. We want to balance seesaw between these sympathetic and these parasympathetics, between the fight or flight and for growth. But if we're stuck in the fight or flight, right, and you're constantly pumping out this hormone cortisol, you know, it has a lot of things. So cortisol, for example, is going to cause 
Uh, it's going to block your insulin hormone, so it contributes to insulin resistance, which means you can't get glucose inside your cells. That's what prediabetes and diabetes is. So this constant fight or flight can yield to things like diabetes, and that means a fuel delivery problem. Mm-hmm. And that's a small example of the crosstalk, you know, there. Um, but you know, again, the constant you know, cortisol is also going to cause damage, and it's going to lead to more of that. Uh, oxidative stress factor. The other thing that happens inherently when people are under chronic stress is what do they do? They change their eating habits, right? They get into what we call stress response eating or emotional eating, what they might call comfort foods. So they, they start turning back more towards starchy foods and things. And they wind up getting caught now in this vicious cycle of being sugar burners. Right? Mm. One thing leads to another. I saw a sugar burner is somebody who is there, they're, they're operating strictly on burning cheap fuel called glucose and it's really you burn that really fast so as mm-hmm. soon as you take it in you burn it fast and then you're in depletion mode again and so your body goes it craves it and you got to get the sugar back in again so you never get to burning fat for fuel you're always just stuck in this glucose burning thing and then you really can't make a shift there unless you're kind of managing that chronic stress response so it's all these these yeah this is kind of this web that needs to be checked now it seems a little overwhelming maybe somebody hearing this but when you're working with somebody who can kind of you know pick these things apart like I do and we help try to prioritize things with people. Mm. And that's really where you start. You have to mm-hmm. kind of prioritize things with people. So if it's if there is this chronic stress response, how best can we come in and help somebody to try to, you know, calm down that stress response and doing some, you know, work to do stress management while maybe we're also regulating the the, the blood sugar thing. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you. I can't uh, throw. I can't. I can't throw. I mean, people want me to. People always ask me, "Can you just give me this? What supplement can I take?" Yeah. What's the one supplement right. you can give me? And I'm like, there is no one supplement. What's I, the my, magic pill? <laughs> yeah. What's the magic pill? What's the magic pill? Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, yeah. I have, you know, I have a patient just really, I have a patient, it's not really a patient. She reached out to me two years ago because she was having so many different problems and I helped her daughter with celiac and she didn't really want to invest in herself at that point, which I didn't understand why. And then she just reached back out to me very recently. So it's two years later and she's so much worse and she's young. Mm-hmm. She's only in her early, early 40s, 40, 41, something like that. And I mean, here's, here's a perfect example. She, her brain fog is so bad that she just doesn't know what she's doing anymore. Mm-hmm. She's forgetful. For where she's where she's driving, she's having a hard time with her checkbook. Uh, she can't remember things. Uh, it's impacting her relationships with her kids. She's having anger issues now. That's what happens with poor brain. Um, plus, she's having joint pains and muscle aches. All these things. Yeah. And she reaches out to me, and we gave her a protocol or program. Um, and, and she turned to me. I was so surprised, and she just she didn't want to invest in that. She just really wanted me to give her some strategy mm-hmm. on what's the one food she could eat or the one food she could should she stop eating, and what's the one supplement that I could just give her to just make her feel better. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm not yeah. a magician. Yeah. This is not no. This requires you know a full throttle approach, right? And mm-hmm. requires addressing all these factors. Yeah, because they all yeah. influence it, you know, like we can't, yeah. we can't look at that. But I think the the problem that I see too sometimes, and I feel like people resonate with this is you get in that cycle of exhaustion of being tired where you don't have the energy and any amount of doing something that could boost your energy still feels wor- like work, right? Like there's that initial resistance of, no, I can't do that. I just need the easy fix. What do you, how do you help people overcome that? That that's point tough. When that's they're... a great question. That's tough. Yeah. That's the tough part. Um, it's like, you know, this is kind of a, a running joke in my field is that people seek you out for care and for help. And you're sitting here with like really like the like the gold the golden egg. Mm. Um, but I hate to kind of say it like this, but it's like so many people because they have such energy problems, and that means you know, poor brain function is they have what we call bad brains. Mm. And you know, one of the things about bad brains is that has they have low motivation. Yeah. And so here you are trying to present them. You have the golden egg and saying, let me just show you how to get there. Um, but they don't have the motivation to do things, right? And that's why they want the easy way out. And that's always a tough part. So, you know, you have to kind of meet people where they're at and just try to give them little things, little inroads to make little yeah. steps. So they begin to kind of go, oh, okay, I, mm-hmm. I kind of get this. And also is you kind of try to lead by example. Mm-hmm. Um, so myself, this is what I'm doing, for example. You know, I, I just started this on a whim. Um, I want to improve my energy. Um, 
you know, I want to get my mitochondria working better. I want to reverse age. I want to slow down my age. I want to improve my vascular health. I want to improve my vitality and keep my brain healthy. Um, so I, I do. I walk the talk as best as I can. You know, there isn't anything that I'm telling the people that I work with that I'm not doing. I, I, don't, I don't stand by that. Yeah. But I just started a, a, a little a personal challenge. Just started. So starting March 1st. I decided to, I was going to get up in, in the day. And before I really get my day started is I'm spending like about 10, 15 minutes and I do five rounds of high intensity cardio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether it's like, you know, burpees or running in place or whatever the heck I need to do. I mix it up a little bit. It's like, I do 30 seconds, high intensity, get my breath, 30 seconds, high intensity, take my breath. And I do five rounds of that. And then my goal is I do uh, 100 pushups. And I might mm -hmm. break that down into four sets of 25 or whatever I'm feeling like doing it. And my commitment to myself is I'm going to do that every single day for 30 straight days and see where I'm at. And I did it this morning. Today was today, the 12th. Mm -hmm. um, so today was day 12. And I'm, I'm glad I've, I'm, I'm stuck with it. Um, but that's it. We have to kind of push ourselves a little bit and challenge ourselves a little bit. And, and sometimes I find that it's really the best way to challenge is to do it with groups. Um yeah. Right. Yeah, like we're starting a mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're we're starting a program next uh, Monday, um, and we're actually calling it a five day energy challenge. Mm. Um, and we're trying to get you know our patients and friends of our patients and get a gathering of people through Facebook and just you know take them through a tutorial. We do it live on Facebook. I put up slides to give them some understanding and education about what energy is all about and keeping it a little more simple. Giving them some strategies, some of, you know, these little biohacks. So yeah. Every day they have a little something they can challenge themselves on. Well, I'm kind of focusing on the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, and you do it in a group community. So when everybody's doing things in a group community, is always greater success, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And I feel like why I love energy so much is because you can really feel it. You know, I think when people want that quick fix, they, they're looking at that destination, that end goal, that big thing that, you know, you're kind of working to manage. But there is a level if we just come to do the little things and we start to experience that and understand that energy flow in our body, we can feel that. We can feel when we have more energy and when we're feeling more tired. And yeah. paying attention to that can help us then to almost personalize for ourselves what are some things that we can do to fill the void if there is one or try to diminish maybe some things that are depleting us, which I think comes back to a topic that I know um, you have mentioned before is the, the idea of good stress and bad stress, you know, mm -hmm. I think understanding that component in the body is, is a big topic because I think we hear the word stress and we automatically go to bad, right, but that's right. not always the case. I mean, when you're talking about working mm -hmm. out, you're, you're pushing your body that is considered a stress on their body. How do, how do you distinguish or define for your clients and patients how to understand right. good stress and when good stress can become bad stress or, you know, like what's, what's the difference there and how do you, how do you use those systems for good? All right. Great question. Again, that's another subject could be an entire podcast just on, <laughs> just on that, you know, but, you know, trying to keep it simple. I think most people kind of have some common sense about this, but um, yeah, stress is gotten a bad rap uh, and certainly stress is debilitating. Um, but you know, stress is also good. Uh, I mean, st bad stress typically is stress, um, where we really have no control over it. Mm. Uh, example of that is COVID, uh, mm. you know, mm -hmm. COVID is one of yeah. those things that, you know, it's just there, you know, uh, early on, we don't know about work, the economy, we don't think we're going to get infected, not get infected. What happens if we get infected? We have no control over over it mm. um, and that's bad stress that's a, you know, an exaggerated example um, uh, physiologically if a person has blood sugar dysregulation if their blood sugar is too high which we call insulin resistance which i said before which we call pre-diabetes or advanced cases diabetes uh, you're not getting glucose inside your cell physiologically that's a stress because your, your mitochondria your cells don't have the fuel to make energy mm. uh, or if your blood sugar was too low hypoglycemic states uh, mm. your, your gas tank is empty either way low or high blood sugar is bad it's a physiological stress to the body suppose in your gut you have what's called dysbiosis or an overgrowth of bad bacteria or yeasts that are releasing a lot of toxins in your gut 
or creating infections in your gut, which is so common, that's going to contribute to a physiological stress. These are not good. Mm -hmm. Good stress, right, is where we can, where our bodies can become stronger and more resilient. Um, it's a term called U stress, E U stress. Mm -hmm. So gravity is an example of that, right? I mean, gravity is stress, but it keeps our bones strong and dense and it keeps yeah. our muscles strong. And if we add to that by lifting weights, which is stressful to the body, but it, 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 it balances back, hopefully, with you know, stronger muscles and healthier joints. Yeah. Right. Some people can function really well under deadlines. Right, they got they got to get pushed in at the last minute. They're staying up all night. They're doing something, doing something, and they're, they're the most creative when they're when they're under stress. Mm -hmm. Right, so that would be that. There's a term called uh, hor hormesis, um, and I think really uh, the perfect example of hormesis is like your your immune system. Right, your immune system actually needs something to do. Right, like the whole body, even the mitochondria yeah. needs a certain degree of right. stress in order for the machine to move. So your immune system needs to be active in doing things. We don't want sterilization of the immune system. Mm -hmm. So you need a little bit of stress there. A very simple example of this is if you use COVID as an example, right? I'm not getting to the politics. But I'm just saying whether you are going to actively get the infection Mm -hmm. or, you know, or you decide to get the vaccination, you kind of working in the similar premise, right? If mm -hmm. you get the vaccination, the intention of the vaccination is to activate your mm -hmm. immune system, the part of the immune system that produces antibodies. Mm -hmm. So the, the vaccination itself is a stressor to the system in a way, and the body responds resiliently by creating these antibodies. If you were infected, right, your immune system is a stress to the immune system. It turns on the immune system. Right. And maybe it zaps your energy a little bit in order to manufacture antibodies so it fights it. And mm -hmm. when you get over it, now you have a memory of that infection and you have resilience going forward. So that's an example of, of good stress. Mm -hmm. It's always seeking you know, balance. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're always seeking that homeostasis, right. that, that, that balance to everything, balance to energy, balance to the immune system, balance in hormones, balance all those things about balance and orchestration. Yeah, and so yeah. most of the people that we're seeing, they literally are out of balance. They're mm -hmm. out of their immune systems are out of balance. Their hormones are out of balance. Their gut environment is out of balance. Right. Right. Which I uh, I love that you said that because I feel like that is a really missing component amongst the health industry. Is you know I think a lot of it is is we understand the balance, but we 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 are people who are fixated on being to these extremes, and even yeah. good things. You know, like you said, like working out, working out to an extreme doesn't always mean equate to great results either. And so it is like finding that balance that works for you, pushing yeah. your body, getting your body into good stress, but understanding that there is that line where good things yep. can turn bad. Um, yeah. and I think it's paying attention to your body. And like you said, just understanding that our body is working for balance yeah. and it's fighting for that. And we can either work with that or against that. And Ultimately, yeah. our body, I, I believe, wins, <laughs> whether for good or for bad at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, people don't realize, they don't think in terms of like uh, with exercise, especially is the, the an equal, if not a greater part of, of, of exercise is the recovery phase. Mm -hmm. Recovery. Yeah. yeah right? right. And so people are, you know, exercising like crazy and they don't get enough sleep. They don't get enough recovery time. Uh, and their body that is going to create a stress response and pumping out stress hormones. And they reason they think, why am I not growing? Why am I not getting stronger? Right. There's no there's no recovery. I mean, I'm all for you know, you know things like CrossFit, but CrossFit's a perfect example where people can, can completely, you know, overtrain and their wheels are coming off. Uh, and that includes young people that they start CrossFit, then they come into me with you know chronic migraines. So I think CrossFit's fantastic, but you know it all depends on the individual person. You know, you, if I can just say something because you got me thinking about something with yeah, exercise, yeah. because this is something I see all the time, and it revolves around cholesterol, the evil mm -hmm. cholesterol, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and tying us into the mitochondria, it's like you know when we're exercising and if we're stressing our bodies and we're trying to lift heavy or walk longer and build endurance, whatever we're doing, right? Is the in doing that, you are literally building more mitochondria. Even though we age, it does, and you lose some mitochondria, it doesn't mean you can't build more mitochondria. Right? If you activate and exercise and do things, you're going to stimulate the action of building more mitochondria. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you build more mitochondria? Well, one of the ingredients in building mitochondria is cholesterol. Mm 
Mm. What? Yeah. Cholesterol yeah. makes up your cells. Cholesterol is in part of what makes up your mitochondria. So you need cholesterol to make mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens if a person is leading a relatively sedentary life and they have no energy and they meet some, whether it's you or me or whoever they go to a trainer and they want to start an exercise program and they start doing things and they're starting to get physically fit and they're eating well and that's all great. So they're losing some weight and are actually gaining some muscle. In order to build more muscle, you need more mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to develop more mitochondria, guess what's going to happen is your cholesterol level is going to have to go up mm -hmm. right? because your liver is making it. It's going to make more cholesterol in order to make more mitochondria. So sometimes when you look at a blood test, you see high cholesterol and all in the medical world, like, oh, that's so bad for the cardiovascular. Yeah. Well, no, you need it because you need to build more mitochondria. Mm -hmm. so when I see cholesterol going up, I, I think of it differently, right? I'm looking and searching around and saying, well, you know, is there some increased need for energy? And is this a sign that there is trying to build more mitochondria to make more energy? Mm. That's a critical thing, right? So mm -hmm. what happens in the medical world, right, is cholesterol is the evil empire for cardiovascular disease. So they give you statin drugs to lower the cholesterol and it works, gets the cholesterol down, but now you don't have the cholesterol to make mitochondria, right? Mm. right? And, I mean, and your heart muscle uses a lot of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So you actually create a cardiovascular problem by putting people on a statin drug. It's, it's mind boggling, right? So cholesterol is not your enemy. You have to consider what your body is doing with cholesterol. Cholesterol is also the precursor for making what we call steroid hormones. So your mm -hmm. estrogen, your testosterone, uh, progesterone, your steroids, like you know, uh, cortisol is all manufactured from cholesterol. So if your body is trying to make more estrogen or more testosterone to build muscle, you need cholesterol to do that. It, I've seen all too often young people, I kid you not, people in their 20s come into my office and men in their 20s and they're dealing with, you say, mood issues and depression and yeah. anxiety, and they have really suboptimal testosterone levels. Mm. And you do further testing, you realize they have really low amounts mm. of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. you're like, well, what, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. You know, you're 22 years old, you have really low cholesterol. So how are you going to have, you know, sufficient testosterone? How are you going to have sufficient energy? Then your neurons, your brain cells are not going to have enough energy to fire. And now you're dealing with depression and you're going to a doctor who's just giving you drugs to manipulate your brain chemical. And meanwhile, you got all this right. dysfunction with low cholesterol and poor mitochondrial right. function. Right. I mean, Makes sense? yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. So when we talk about mitochondria, you know, you kind of said, it decreases as we age, but we can, like you said, have some ways with the right movement and other things that can build those mitochondria, obviously with the energy on the backside. What are some other tips that you could give people that are really important in the field of mitochondria and producing energy, even as we age? Um, I'm not sure you're asking me, how do you improve mitochondria? How do you, how do you build more as our body works to produce less? So your body, what happens, you know, your body has, um, this goes back to just, you know, the beginning of time. Uh, the body by nature wants to conserve energy. That's its inherent yeah. nature because really the conservation of energy is survival based. We live mm -hmm. in modern times, <laughs> right? but if you didn't live in modern times, you never knew from day to day where your food source was coming from. And you never knew from day to day, whether you were going to survive or not, you know, from threats, you know, but we live in modern times and we live with conveniences and, you know, access for the most people, you know, is, you know, food is everywhere and we have conveniences and we have, you know, sedentary lifestyle. I mean, my point is, is that the, the cons conservation of energy goes back to the beginning of time. So that's mm. the inherent nature of how the body works. So the body, when we talk about being lazy, it's really it wants to conserve energy. Mm -hmm. So you have to push beyond that in order to stimulate growth. Right? So the mm -hmm. only way, so in other words, if I'm making this clear, as you get older, right, you get more sedentary and the body loses more mitochondria because there's no activation or reason to grow mitochondria. Mm -hmm. It wants to keep kind of conserving, conserving, conserving. Right? But eventually that's going to cause an early death. So we have to push past that. So the, the you, movement is the answer. Mm 
Mm. Right? You can't build mitochondria without activation. You can't build yeah. mitochondria without moving your body and exercising your body. And you just can't stop moving your body and then just stay at that level. You got to again get to another level. You can't just lift a five pound. If you didn't lift any weights and you start lifting a five pound weight, it's pretty hard. Yeah. And then you start doing it and you start getting more mitochondria, you start getting more strength and the five pound weight gets pretty easy. But if you never increase the weight to 10 pounds, then you can't continue growth. So you got to keep putting a little bit more resistance, a little bit more good stress there. Mm -hmm. Now with your brain, right? I mean, exercise, physical exercise feeds your brain. So that's fuel for your brain. But you also need brain exercise. Mm. That's why we know that adults that live well into the late years, into the, into the centurions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, continue to keep their brains alive. They do physical mm -hmm. exercise. We, they've done studies now. They know that even people never exercise a day in their life. If they started doing weight training and resistance training starting in their 90s, mm -hmm. literally they are showing improvements. Wow. They're showing that they can get better muscle tone. They can improve some bone density, improve some mitochondrial function. Right? It's never too late to start. But even mentally, it's like, you know, you want to do mental stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the same things day in and day out, and day, like you're almost numb, right? You're not exercising your brain. Mm. So if people decide to do something different, doing crossword puzzles or just like, you know, you just drive a different direction, you take a different route to the office, right? Or you just do things that are just different to stimulate your brain. It's said in my world that the brain needs two things. It needs fuel, fuel, oxygen, glucose, all those things. And it needs activation. Mm. Right? You have to activate mm -hmm. it. So we need to be, you know, do mental exercises and physical exercises, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, you know, again, you got to start small and build. That's what Yeah, it yeah. You know, it just, uh, they always say it's kind of a, it was a, a Chinese proverb, right? A, a thousand mile journey starts with the first step. Mm. And mm -hmm. that's what you got to do. Where do you start? Mm -hmm. You start with the first step. Yeah. No, just, start, with, start with day one. Yeah. Even when I work with people, I'm asking them to do things, whether it's change your diet and do a 30 day anti-inflammatory diet. And for some people, it's like, you know, the world is coming to an end. Like what? I'm like, oh, look, if you can't give me 30 days, can you give me 10 days? Mm -hmm. you know, if you can't mm -hmm. give me 10 days, can you give me Can you give me a weekend? I mean, just start. Yeah, right. And then just start doing things and build some momentum, right? Mm -hmm. The big thing, I think I'm t talking so much, but even with exercise, what's more critical is consistency. Anything mm -hmm. we do is consistency, right? You're better off doing something, you know, 15, 20 minutes every day than doing, you know, two hours, you know, twice a week on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your body likes routine, like your brain works on circadian rhythms. And so consistency is way more impactful and beneficial than just trying to, not that you can't get out there and jump around and do tennis and whatever you want to do for two hours on a week. I'm just saying, but you know, you just can't say Monday through Friday is um, a couch potato and then right. Saturday and Sunday I'm a, I'm a gym rat. That, that your brain doesn't like that and you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. And it can mm -hmm. actually be, you know, uh, negative in the cardiovascular system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So wow. Consistency is the key thing there. You know, yeah. you know how many heart attacks happen on a golf course? <laughs> no, I kid you not. I kid you not because you have really overweight people that are not doing much, uh, that have problems with their blood sugar. They got, you know, their hormones are messed up. They have bad guts, right? They got all that visceral fat. And they get out there and they're dr driving around their carts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like golf, but they're driving around their carts. But then they get up to the tee and they take this humongous swing to try to drive the ball 300 yards. Mm. And that burst of exertion just causes their heart to collapse. Wow. Right? They were You're walking right. time I, bombs. I, yeah, right? They were walking time bombs, but it's those, those, those bursts of energy. Mm -hmm. right? So we want that slow, consistent, yeah. you know, boom, boom, boom. You know, that's what right. you want. That balance. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a wealth of knowledge. I feel like we could do many other podcasts together yeah, yeah. and dive into some of these topics more. But the last question is, is just really like, what is that one last piece of advice you would like the world to know that you would like people to really take to heart? You know, I'm at this, again, a really long time. And uh, personally, I probably could have thrown in the towel a, a hundred times over the years. But really, what keeps me here and keeps me going back to school and learning and sharing and sharing my platform now virtually and stuff like that is getting this message out because I think it's so impactful. I mean, it's, just, it, it's impacted my life and I want it to impact people's lives. I think really the world is just going to be a happier and better place when people are just more, have more energy and their brains are working mm. better. They're going to make better decisions have better relationships and the world 
world globally would be a happier and healthier and more engaging place. Um, and what I like to really share with people is that, you know, turn and get, get help, turn and get mm -hmm. resources. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you can get it through the internet and people like yourself are doing podcasts, you know, reach out to me, whatever, but you know, is that, um, the health that you're in today is not your destiny, you mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you may need medication here and there to help little things, but really it's, it's, you got to start looking at things from a lifestyle choice. Uh, and, and, the, and the earlier you intervene, the better. And this even goes with young kids, you know, young kids, it's never too early to start. Right. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the message that I like to get out there. Yeah. 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 And you do a lot of work, um, with people and testing and all kinds of integrative medicine. Can you tell us where we can learn more about you, what you do and where people could reach out if they want to uh, yeah, start great. working Yeah, great. Thanks for you. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we have gone now mostly virtual since COVID happened and that's been kind of a, a small blessing for us in a way. We're able to reach more people. Uh, but yeah, I think the easiest thing for people to do is to go to my website, uh, which is getwell hyphen now.com which is g-e-t-w-e-l-l -L -L, with that middle dash hyphen n-o-w.com and if you just go there uh we have on there a free mini course it's really great on functional medicine it takes a little bit of a deeper dive so you can get a better understanding what functional medicine is the philosophy the approach the testing uh and really see if, fun if a functional medicine approach is the right approach for you so it's a really good free educational resource mm -hmm. and of course we also have a uh a uh, Facebook group page, which is pretty interactive, where a lot of people can post questions and stuff. And that's uh, Root Cause Healing. You can just search for that. Perfect. Well, I will okay. make, yeah, I will make sure and link all of that up in the show notes so that you can find um, all the information that we're looking for. And I just really thank you so much for being on the show and for the work that you've done, for staying in this, uh, for all the learning that you've done to bring us this knowledge that you have. Um, and now it's just time to go out and take action. So thank you so much for yeah. being here. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm sure you enjoyed that podcast just as much as I did. I love talking about energy movement in the body. And as you can tell, I really believe it is the secret to health because it is a very thing that makes sense of everything we encounter and helps you understand not just what you do to your body, but what your body is doing with it. And what your body's doing with what you provide is truly creating the results. Because you can count calories all day and you can do all of this stuff, this perfect equation externally. But at the end of the day, what matters is what's happening on the inside. And understanding that energy level inside of your body can make a world of difference. So if you want to help with your energy, go over to thelivingwell.com and check out that free energy quiz. Coming up very soon, I'm going to be launching an energy fix, which is a short program that's going to teach you how to up-level your energy so that your brain can thrive, so that your entire body can thrive. And it is not as complicated as we make it out to be, but it truly comes from an awareness of how your body is working and what's going to fill it up. So make sure you check out The Living Well to get all the information on today's show, to get some additional brain fillers, and sign up for my email list where you'll be the first to know about the energy fix coming very soon. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Next week, I'm gonna be back on and we're gonna talk about the law of attraction and whether it's true and what you need to know about it and really understanding that whole manifestation uh, that happens on a more biblical level, I guess you could say. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back next week talking more about that. 